belong to what people refer to as Generation X. And even though my generation is known for its cynicism, I actually felt optimistic growing up. I lived in Germany as a child at the time that the Berlin Wall came down. And so I experienced this time as a time of opening borders and new horizons. It was also a time of groundbreaking discoveries. This is me at 10 years old, climbing the Temple of Apollo in Cyprus on a family vacation. I felt like an explorer, and there was so much out there to be discovered. It was also the beginning of the information revolution. The internet was brand new, and anything seemed possible. And since then, it has really profoundly changed all of our lives. We can connect with people on the other side of the world instantly, and we can find stories on literally any topic under the sun. You know, when you stop and think about it, it's really incredible. But it has also led to this, where we now spend more and more of our time online. Just last year, Americans spent four hours every day browsing the internet. That's nearly a quarter of our waking hours, or half of a working day. So access to the open internet is great, and we shouldn't take any of that for granted. But all the time that we're spending online has also given rise to the attention economy, where to grab our attention, we are fed smaller and smaller bites of information that cater to our smaller and smaller attention spans. And it's also information that doesn't challenge our existing beliefs. Search engines, social media, they bombard us with clickbait and headlines that are all just designed to grab our attention and evoke an emotional reaction from us. While huge online stores present us with product after product that we may or may not actually want. So it's with all this information overload that many of us feel like we can't keep up and that we also can't unplug when we need to. Richard Saul Werman, the founder of TED, he calls this information anxiety. And he writes in his book, information anxiety is the black hole between data and knowledge. And it happens when information doesn't tell us what we want or need to know. So he wrote this in 1989, but it's more true today than ever. So as we're out there searching, browsing the internet, looking at anything we want whenever we want, it makes sense that many of us feel like we're just not in control. And I think the problem is this, that ultimately we need better tools. We need better tools for accessing information. And I think that data visualization can help. You know, think about the tools that we use today. We can search for answers, we can browse product catalogs, we can build our social networks and share ideas online, and overall we can create a huge amount of content. But what these tools don't let us do is to step back and see the big picture. They don't let us see connections, and they don't let us organize information in ways that would make sense to us. And that's what I want to talk about today. What we need to confront the issue of information anxiety isn't more information, we need ways to see it better. We need interfaces that can help us make sense of all this information around us. And again, data visualization can help. Why? Because it can help us see the big picture and the details. And it can also let us see connections. But what would these interfaces look like? You know, I've been a visual designer for over 15 years now, and it's hard, I'll be the first to admit. If not search engines, social media, online platforms and feeds, then what? What would these look like? Well, here's an early project of mine that I think really demonstrates how data visualization can help make all this information more understandable. And it's called Invisible Cities. So this is a project I worked on with a former student, Lee J. Shah, and it aims to represent the social networks in the urban environment. It does that by visualizing data from Twitter, real-time data from Twitter, on a three-dimensional base map of a city. This is a collection of tweets, and this is how we're used to consuming social data today as a feed. Now look at that same information in invisible cities. Here we have a space that we can explore, and we're actually looking at Manhattan and the other boroughs of New York. 
The tweets themselves are the white dots that you see, and they've fallen from the sky, and as they come in, they change the landscape, creating hills and valleys that represent the different data densities over time. You can also click on a tweet not only to see its contents, but also to show connections. And those connections are then also expressed on the right-hand side of the screen, the topics that you see there. So Invisible Cities makes social data visible and discoverable as if it were a physical landscape. I didn't realize it at the time, but Invisible Cities was also a response to my own personal feelings of disconnectedness. Between ages 6 and 11, we moved from Germany to the US, then from the US to England, and then back to Germany. And so with all this moving around at a young age, it was really hard for me to connect with any culture around me. I just had so many different points of reference. And later, when I moved back to the US for college, that feeling stayed, and it's honestly been with me ever since. Really, my entire life, I felt like an outsider looking in. And so to confront these feelings of disconnectedness in relation to the cultures around me, I began to look for ways to understand them better. When I was a teenager, we moved back to Lübeck, the city in northern Germany where I'm from. And Lübeck is a city with a thousand years of history. And on moving back, I was really struck by the many layers in the urban fabric the layers and layers of meaning that had resulted from literally centuries of human activity. And so in my last year of high school, I took a camera and I went out onto the streets of Lübeck in an attempt to document the city. I took pictures of the architecture, the people. I was trying to capture the essence of the city. In many ways, I was like a tourist in my own hometown. And what I discovered was that the culture was literally embedded in the shape of the city. It was in the architecture of the buildings, it was in the size and the shape of the streets. It was all around me. And so my takeaway from this experience, which I still think about today, is that cities are a kind of physical information space. When it comes to digital interfaces, we need to be able to explore information like we explore cities. You know, we explore cities by using maps. So maps can help us orient ourselves. We can understand the shape and the structure of the city. But it's the on-the-ground experience where we can explore, where we can discover all the nooks and crannies, the story that a city has to tell. We can be like tourists. And that is what we need for information experiences as well. We need to be able to explore information spaces the same way, with these two levels of detail these two different scales, the macro and the micro. And that way, we can start to see connections between the parts and the whole. Has anyone here seen the movie Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark? If you've ever seen this film, then no doubt you'll remember the scene at the end where the Ark is transported to a vast government warehouse filled with hundreds, thousands of boxes that are all labeled top secret and every one of these boxes contains an artifact that also has a story to tell. And I always think of this scene when I think of the millions of stories out there just waiting to be told, just waiting to be discovered. In many ways, the internet is like a city. It has layers and layers of meaning resulting from human activity. But it's also a lot like this warehouse in that all the stories that it has to tell, many of those remain hidden, hidden from view. What if we could open these boxes and unearth these stories? What if we could become information archaeologists? The Opti Project is a visualization that was created almost 16 years ago by Barrett Lyon, and it visualizes the entire internet. It uses a technology called the trace route, which basically maps every IP address on the internet, every device connected to the web. And so what we see here is the vastness and the complexity of the internet itself, and also the potential for all those stories that it contains. And it's data visualizations like this that can help us see the whole. But importantly, they are also beautiful, right? They inspire us to look and to keep looking. 
And what we see when we look is that there's so much there to be discovered. They really awaken a desire for exploration. Eight years ago, I started Schema, a research and design firm based in Seattle. And our mission at Schema is to explore and illuminate the important issues of our time. Our medium is data visualization, which lets us see context and connections in ways that other media simply can't. And so at Schema, we create interfaces that help people discover and share topics they care about, from arts and culture, to science, to news and politics. And I wanted to share two projects that I think really capture the power of data visualization to tell meaningful stories. Starting with Legislative Explorer, this was a project we worked on with the Center for American Politics and Public Policy at UW, the University of Washington. And it pulls back the curtain on Congress. It's an interactive visualization that helps us understand patterns of lawmaking. It uses open data from congress.gov, where all this data is available. You can actually see it here. But it's neither easy to browse, nor is it really possible to see it in aggregate in such a way that you might find patterns. And that's what Legislative Explorer does. It shows the big picture of US lawmaking. We can see the bills and the resolutions and follow their path from introduction all the way through to their outcome. The visualization shows the Senate on the left and the House on the right, as well as the White House in the middle. And we can also see every stage of the process labeled on the map. The bills are the dots, and they're color-coded by party. Red for Republican, blue for Democrat. And as we play back each two-year session of Congress, we can see these bills stream in, move from introduction all the way through the process to eventually becoming law. And we can also zoom in to see the details. And this lets us browse the bills in more detail. We can see the title, the description, the party affiliation. And we can even click through to then find the contents of that bill up on congress.gov. So this visualization gives us a space that we can explore and use to discover insights. It makes Congress feel tangible. And it lets us feel like flies on the wall. You know, if you're, um, if you're like me, then you probably don't know in detail what happens in government. Even though all of us vote every few years, we don't really know the path that a bill takes in order to become law, or the amount of legislation that needs to be introduced versus the small percentage of bills that actually end up becoming law in the end. And it's these stories that Legislative Explorer can help us discover. It makes it possible to understand our government better. And we can also find stories on specific bills we may care about, anything as mundane as the naming of a new post office to bills as impactful as the Affordable Care Act. The second project is the lifespan of news stories. And this is a project we worked on with Google and the news group Axios. And it aims to visualize the public attention span around the news. We do that by visualizing Google search data for the top news stories. Think about how you consume the news today. Whether on your phones or on your laptops, it's usually just a list or a feed of information. And that's fine, but it doesn't let us see connections. And it also doesn't let us see the impact that any story may be having at a societal level. And that's what we're trying to do with this visualization. So Lifespan visualizes the entire 2018 news cycle. So here you can find the Hawaii missile warning, the government shutdown, SpaceX story, and others. And every story that you see in this timeline is visualized as a graph that shows both the intensity of search interest, meaning how many times people actually searched for that story or article online, and also the duration of that event, how long it stayed in the public eye. Let's go back to about a year ago. There was a whole cluster of impactful events. So here we had, for example, and you may remember these, Hurricane Florence, followed by Hurricane Michael, we had the slow build-up to the midterm elections. It was also the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation hearings and Dr. Ford's testimony. And so these are all ongoing stories that show the ebb and flow of search interest as new information came to light. But if we go a little further, we can also find this story, the climate report, 
which you may remember was released by the Trump administration on a Black Friday. And it's a tiny blip in the timeline. It actually is the smallest search score of any, any story. 0.3 out of 100. Compare that to Hurricane Florence, which is tied with Hurricane Michael for the biggest search score, 50 out of 100. And think about the irony of that. The climate report gets the smallest search interest, the hurricanes get the most of all. It's that comparison and that disconnect. That's an example of the kind of story that we can find here. And at any point, you can also click through to learn more about any of these topics. So rather than a news feed with information that comes in and out of your day, the lifespan of news stories lays it out for you in a way that makes it feel manageable. It creates a space that we can explore. And it also gives shape to our collective memory. And what I think is most interesting about this to me is that you can find stories that may have resonated with you personally and see the impact that they had at a societal level. It gives us a whole new perspective on the news. In the end, I think what we need are interfaces that awaken a desire for exploration. Even if the journey towards understanding is challenging, especially when it is, we need these interfaces more than ever. And I think the question becomes, how might we create more interest in research and exploration? How might we create deeper, more meaningful perspectives on the world? And how might we get back that feeling of possibility when the internet was still new? Data visualization can be the antidote to information anxiety, and it can help us explore the internet's growing information landscape. It can also help us dig, like archaeologists. And I think in the end, it can create the awareness that can help us become a more connected and open society. Thank you.